If you knew there was a Bible story about a woman and Jesus and some perfume, but you couldn't quite remember who the woman was or when in Jesus's ministry she went to him or what kind of ointment she brought or what she did with that ointment exactly, well, you're in good company. Each of the four Gospels of the New Testament describes a woman who approached Jesus intending to anoint him. In Matthew and Mark, it is his hair involved. An unnamed woman enters Simon's house, where Jesus is the guest, and she pours an expensive ointment over Jesus' head. This happens during the last week of Jesus' life, and it's tied to preparations for his burial. Luke's version of the story happens earlier in Christ's ministry, at the home of a different Simon, a Pharisee. There, Jesus is again eating supper, when a woman widely known to be a sinner slips into the room and stands behind Jesus, weeping. Then she falls to his feet, bathing his feet with her tears, drying them with her hair, and rubbing them with some ointment she's brought. Simon is scandalized, but Jesus tells the woman she's forgiven and can go in peace. Only in John's version of the story do we learn the woman's name and her relationship to Jesus. Here it is Mary, sister to Martha and Lazarus, Mary, whom Jesus loved, Mary, whose brother Christ had brought back from the dead. Mary anoints Jesus' feet soon after the chief priests and Pharisees have decided to kill Jesus. Her action anticipates his death. Not only that, her action anticipates Jesus' action. Before long, Christ will kneel to wash his disciples' feet. In so doing, Jesus will show them how love and service look. Here, Mary shows them too. What the four stories have in common is how shocked and uncomfortable everyone but Jesus becomes in response to the woman's actions. In John, where I'll focus today, nearly everything Mary does is offensive to those who witness her actions and strange to us who read about them now. Mary lets down her hair in a room full of men, which a respectable woman in her time would never have done. She pours perfume on Jesus' feet, which also was not done. And then she touches him, an unmarried woman caressing the feet of a rabbi, completely inappropriate, even among friends. Then she wipes his feet clean with her hair, a strange end to a strange act. But what's amazing, I think, in Matthew, Mark, and John is that no one comments on any of that. What shocks them most of all is not how Mary behaved, but that she used all that ointment. They are most appalled at her waste of good money. By all accounts, the ointment Mary used to anoint Jesus was very expensive, worth a year's wages, some say, enough to feed a family for a long, long time. Judas was upset because it meant there was less for him to steal. But others were upset too. This expenditure of so much money seemed impossible to justify. My friend Casey Tomey, reflecting on Mary's gratuitous gift to Christ and his own discomfort with it, told my pastor's study group about a woman in the first church he served years ago when Casey was just a fledgling pastor in a small town in West Tennessee. The woman's name was Jessie. She lived in a somewhat run-down section of town, Casey said, in a little three-room clapboard house with a rotting front porch. 
Some members of the church became aware of the front porch because one day a board gave way beneath Jessie and she lost her balance and fell and broke her leg. So the church organized a work detail, took several members of the congregation to Jessie's house and replaced her porch. She was so touched and grateful, said Casey. All she could do when we departed that day was to stand on the new porch and weep. Sometime later, KC visited Jessie and drank a cup of coffee in her kitchen. The house was clean, he said, but the furnishings were spare and the curtains were threadbare. Jessie had been confined for a number of months with that broken leg, unable to come to church or even get out to the grocery store. As we chatted, she began to talk about her pledge to the church. She felt guilty about it, she said. She tithed, but she went on to say, because of her condition and the many doctor's bills that were rolling in, she'd fallen behind. The Lord has been so good to me, she said, and I feel so badly that I haven't kept up with my pledge. Now, Casey knew that Jessie's only income was her social security check and that for her, a tithe meant 10% off the top before anything else. She made me feel guilty, Casey said. I wasn't making a huge salary by any means, but I had a beautiful home and a nice car and I played golf regularly and went out to dinner occasionally. And you better believe I didn't come close to being a tither. Truth is, Casey said, not only was I not a tither, I didn't feel all that blessed. I wanted more of the things of this life that money can buy. And I was, to be brutally honest, envious of others who had more than I did. And when Casey told us the story 30 years after it happened, he said Jesse's comment was still ringing in his ears. The Lord has been so good to me. Because Jessie felt so blessed, she did a reckless, extravagant thing. She tithed. Casey wanted to say to her, Jessie, don't give so much. You're poor. You're sick. You should give the money to the poor, to yourself. Buy yourself a new dress. Get some pretty new curtains for the living room. Don't give so much. Like KC years ago, I sometimes fear that I, today, have a lot to learn about gratitude and generosity. I thought that recently as I looked at a photo essay online of children around the world pictured with their most prized possessions. Toy Stories, the project's called. There's a small boy from Malawi with two tiny stuffed dogs and a plastic dinosaur. There's a little girl from Italy with three princess dresses and a row of Barbies and several stuffed animals of her own. There's a boy from Ukraine with at least a dozen toy guns, a girl from Haiti with one doll and a bunch of plastic barrettes, a child from India with more stuffed toys and board games than you can count. Of course, there are some considerable differences in the pictures. You can tell the rich kids from the poor ones. And I know if I were to line up my own favorite possessions, it'd be clear I'm among the rich. But here is what was most humbling to me. The photographer said that while the kids he met had much in common, at their age they just wanted to play, he said. How the kids play differed from country to country. He found that the children in richer countries were more possessive with their toys, that it took time before they allowed him to play with them. In the poorer countries, he found it much easier to interact quickly with the kids, even if there were just two or three toys between them. Sometimes, the more we have, 
the more possessive we become. That's one of the trappings of money, whether it's in the form of a common purse or a room full of toys or a house or a retirement fund. We find ourselves wanting to hold back something, to save the perfume, if you will, for ourselves, for a rainy day, for a cause we judge deserving. Those impulses are in tension with a discipleship like Mary's. Mary does not explain herself in this story. We don't know what she was thinking when she took up that bottle and knelt before Jesus. We don't know whether she had counted the cost to herself or to her family, if she had weighed the pros and cons of her actions, or if she acted on impulse that day. What we do know, thanks to John, is that Mary had some sense of what was going to happen to Jesus. And it's fair to guess that as Mary looked upon Christ that night, she was overcome with love and gratitude. Maybe as she knelt, she remembered the story of her people, how God had made a way in the sea for them, a path through the mighty waters. Perhaps she remembered how faithful God had been to them when loyalty demanded sacrifice and the loving was thankless and hard. Perhaps she marveled at Christ's own faithfulness, his dedication to helping those in trouble, to opening blind eyes, strengthening weak knees, and raising the dead, even her own brother. Maybe Mary foresaw the suffering that awaited Jesus, the betrayals of the week to come, the long road of the passion, the extent to which his love for the world would press Jesus to empty himself, to give his life so that we might live. How else can you honor such a gift? Someone in my congregation asked after reading this story. How else but to pour yourself out in response, to give whatever you had in return? How else can you honor such a gift? How do you and I honor Christ's gift? I had never thought much about it before, but I guess it's no coincidence that many churches receive a special offering on Easter Day. In my denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, the Easter offering is called the One Great Hour of Sharing offering and it supports disaster assistance and community development around the world. I've heard the North American Mission Board supports the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, it supports missionaries in North America. Such offerings are chances to respond to Christ's great gift with gifts of our own, chances to share what we have in a sacrificial way, in response to Christ's own sacrifice. When we feed those who are hungry for food and for truth, when we rebuild the homes of people who have suffered fire and flood, say, or whose households need more of God's forgiveness and Christ's good news, when we make such offerings, we kneel at the feet of Christ who promised to keep coming to us in the guise of people who need help. Here are chances to care for Christ in ways that are gracious, even great. We don't always spend our money or our time or our energy on the things we most value. Much of what I do really is a waste. But in this story, we are called to appreciate Jesus and the gifts 
He gives, to see how good God always is, and to be moved by gratitude. Jesus is on his way to the cross, on his way to giving everything for us. Now is not the time to measure our response to him. Now's not the time to hold back, is it? <laughs>